This podcast is brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling for those who make and drink great spirits. Join our free email newsletter for technical and creative distilling stories in your inbox every week. Learn more at spiritsanddistilling.com. Hello, welcome to the Craft Spirits and Distilling Podcast. I'm your host, Molly Troop, and today with me, I have Nick Christensen from Barrel Craft Spirits. G&D Chillers understands that each distillery's chilling requirements are unique. On every distillery project, G&D offers the front-end design and engineering your team needs at no cost to you. Rebecca Harris, president and head distiller of Catoctin Creek Distillery, recently shared, service after the sale is what really separates the quality of a supplier relationship. G&D Chillers has always been a phone call away when we needed them. For a small business like mine, that partnership makes all the difference. Whether you distill batch by batch or in a continuous operation, for more than 30 years, G&D has had the proven solution. Visit them today at gndchillers.com. And for over 11 years, ABS Commercial has been your full-service equipment manufacturer, designing quality distillation equipment ranging from 50 liters to 5,000 liters. Whether establishing a new distillery or expanding into a brew distillery, their team of experienced engineers and designers work with you to develop customized distilling solutions. With their consultative approach, they tailor to your production capacity, space constraints, and budgetary considerations to help you create quality crafted spirits. Contact them today at sales at abs-commercial.com to discuss your customized distilling needs. Today with me, I have Nick Christensen from Barrel Craft Spirits. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to, to be here talking to you today. Yeah, well, with no further ado, let's dive into how you got started in the spirits industry. Yeah, so this is always an interesting story. I love, uh, I feel like there's like a million different ways that people end up here. And I love hearing everyone's story because it's all different. But um, so for me... I think a lot of it goes back to uh, like early childhood. So I, even though I didn't realize it at the time, obviously, (laughs) but uh, I started uh, cooking at a very young age and uh, I was kind of split between the way my mom would teach me to cook and the way my dad would teach me to cook. And one was technique driven and one was intuitive cooking. Uh, So tasting and making adjustments. Um, So I just, I loved that. So I would make food. I would uh, try to make things taste better over and over. And then I would also, you know, cook my family or friends and, and watch their reaction and kind of like file that away in my brain of like, how can I make this better next time? Or, you know, what could I do to enhance this? And um, none of this was like, it was just like, I was, I just liked doing it. So I wasn't like trying to do anything. It was just part of kind of what made me tick at that time. So um, I think all of those experiences kind of created a feedback loop for me where I wanted to create something in like a artistic and flavorful kind of way and make it better than I made it before or make it better than things that I've tried that were similar before and then be able to share it with others and see, you know, see their reaction. And uh, ultimately, obviously, I want to make something that people will enjoy um so i think early on that was just like instilled in me yeah so i was going to school for graphic design but i felt a pull towards the culinary world and cooking so i kind of started to follow that path and that led me to Louisville. um i was living in cincinnati before that and i started working in the kitchen of a bourbon bar in 2011 so that was kind of the golden age of bourbon. Uh, nothing was really allocated at that time. And, um, you know, I was in the heart of bourbon world. So uh, I could try anything at that time, uh, which I wasn't a bourbon drinker. Um, but being in Louisville, when you meet people and you're talking to people, all of a sudden they're just like, here, have this bourbon. and Here, try this bourbon. And so I started kind of dabbling and tasting. And I realized that it wasn't just something that all tastes the same, all bourbon tastes the same. And not only was it not that, but there were so many unique flavors that I wasn't expecting. And so many stories and different mash bills, different types of distillation. And I just kind of got lost in that world. And um, 
I would go to the bar after my shift every night and I would talk to the bartender. I'd say, okay, give me a bourbon I've never had and tell me about it and taste it. I did that um, for months until I realized I wanted to start bartending and start studying flavor and liquid forms instead of in the kitchen. So, so I moved to bartending and I just wanted to learn as much as possible. Um, so, um, luckily I ran into or connected with, uh, some really good people who kind of were able to teach me a lot. And uh, Gary Groover was one of those people. He, um, at the time was the mixologist for Southern Wine Spirits in Kentucky, but he's now the global mixologist for Mar Marriott. And um, I learned a lot from him about cocktails and flavor, the history of alcohol. And um, he also taught me to think of myself as a business. So make decisions as if, you know, you are the CEO of this business. It's not just a career where you have fun and, you know, play around, like take it seriously. And so I, I really tried to put in a lot of work of studying and learning uh, in any means um, possible. So do you recall the first uh, bourbon that you fell in love with? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, uh, the first bourbon that I fell in love with was Rock Hill Farms oh. from uh, Buffalo Trace. So it's not something that you see anymore. And uh, it was a sad day when I realized that it was just hard. They stopped, basically stopped making a lot of it. So it's hard to find, but I still have a few bottles tucked away. For a special day, I'm, hope, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just different back then. It was really cool to just be able to try anything. And the bourbon world has changed so much. And it's a lot better in a lot of ways, but uh, but I do miss the ability to just like, hey, can I try this? And it's on the shelf and anyone can taste it. Uh, the accessibility of it uh, was really, really crucial for me at that point. Oh, yeah. it's um, These days, it's really easy to rack up a, a mean bar tab just trying to taste everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very, very different now. Um but there's also a lot more people drinking bourbon and spirits and stuff. So there's, there's good and bad things on that side. Absolutely. So you were, you were bartending, you were being taught about um, like the, how to make it like your business and take it seriously. Uh, what, at what point did you decide that you wanted to work on the production side? So I guess that kind of started, um, after I started working at Butchtown Grocery, which is a, was a restaurant in Louisville. Um, I started there in 2016. And um, it was, if you've ever been there, if anyone's ever been there, uh, it was like a very, very special restaurant. Um, everything was thought out. Um, everything was flavor focused. And uh, Chef Bobby Benjamin, he was... Uh, he's a bit of a, a mad genius when it comes to food and flavor and uh, and his vision for a restaurant. So I was beverage director there and I was working with him uh, very closely and we were um, just constantly studying flavor um, in food form and beverage form and uh, wine, beer, spirits, um, literally everything. And, um, you know, he was pushing me to search for a lot of things and um, how I create my cocktails and my uh, my program. So um, I was able to build a very extensive whiskey program with a, uh, at the time, a very extensive uh, private barrel program. So um, we had about 22 barrels uh, the time that I left, which is a lot for a restaurant. Uh, so I was lucky enough to, to be able to put that barrel program together. And every time I went to distillery, I was tasting cash strength bourbon out of the barrel. I was just like falling more in love with whiskey again. Mm -hmm. It's like, it brought me into the industry and now I'm like, I've done all these other things and studied all these other things, but just like, man, I just love this. And I love drinking that cash strength and, <laughs> um there's just like nothing better so mm -hmm. um it also was a time when um barrel craft spirits was um they just 
won best bourbon of the year on Forbes. So it's kind of like looking at that and Joe Beatrice, the the owner and founder, uh, him and Trip Simpson would come into the restaurant sometimes and like bring new samples to try and stuff. And I was just constantly impressed with the product. And I loved that they were blending because I felt like that was something I wanted to learn about. I wanted to be a part of that I wanted to do. And, um, you know, all these other distilleries were distilling and doing their thing and making great products. But Barrel was over here kind of doing its own thing and creating things that didn't exist before. Um, so I really wanted to be a part of that. Uh, luckily, they had an opening for a um, single barrel coordinator and uh, I applied for the position. And um, and so I started in 2019 as a single barrel coordinator. So what, what exactly um, was your role as a single barrel coordinator? So it was essentially to um, select barrels for the um, single barrel program, um, you know, communicate with the, the sales team and uh, accounts on selecting the barrels and you know, getting them out to accounts. So everything that is involved in that process. Mm-hmm. Um, I was pretty quickly and luckily um, involved in the blending process also, even though it was unofficial at the time, but I was able to, you know, get in the lab and uh, work with Tripp and Joe uh, kind of see how they, how their process works and how much time and energy goes into creating the blends, Mm -hmm. um, how they're tasting them and thinking about them and making decisions based on how it tastes. One fun story I like to uh, tell is my very first day on the job, I was uh, called into the lab and they had two glasses on the table. And uh, they're like, hey, can you, uh, you taste these and just let us know what you think. And uh, it was the gray label bourbon release for that year, which was uh, at the time our highest um, price point item. And it was only released once a year. It was a very special product. And um, they were tied on the, the tastes and the flavors. So, so I came in and uh, broke the tie and uh, made a really good product. And then uh, from there, we kind of formed this uh, triangle of understanding each other's flavor profiles and being honest with what's going to work the best for the whiskey um, and uh, create good products. I think that, um, with, especially with a bartending background and working with spirits too, uh, with blending, it kind of gives you this really nice purview into flavors and how to construct stuff. Um, did you find that really helpful as you, uh, progressed, um, at barrel with your, um, from single barrel coordinator coordinator to what's, what is your current role? (laughs) Uh, it is blender and manager of blending operations. Very lengthy title. title. Very lengthy, hard to fit on a, (laughs) on a business card. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, I think it did. And I think, my last visit position working with Chef Bobby, um, he really looked at ingredients as, you know, you have to respect every single ingredient and you don't want to, like, you're not trying to force something to become something that you don't want it to be. So you want to understand each ingredient in every capacity in every way that you can. And then from there, find other ingredients that work together to harmonize or to bring out different flavor notes or to create complexity or texture or or whatever it is. Um, But really understanding what you're working with before you're trying to create something. And, and I was able to really translate that over to my uh, cocktails at that time and, um, you know, subtle micro changes can really like change the whole outcome of the the flavor profile, which is really cool uh, when you dial it in and, and get those kind of nuances going. And so um, blending is very similar, uh, just different versions of, you know, ingredients and then different scales of size. So you, um, single barrel coordinator, when did you make the, uh, when, when did you make that change? Uh, when did you get promoted? 
I guess I started in 2019 by the spring of 2020. I was assistant blender, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so officially on the blending team at that at that time. And I've still, the entire time, still o- been overseeing the private barrel program mm-hmm. uh, as well. So it's it's never left me. Um, to this and, day, uh, that's that's great. Yeah. So, and our private barrel programs evolved a lot over the time over the since the first day I started. So we're not doing true single barrels anymore because we're blenders. So what we're doing is uh, private barrels that are actually micro blends, mm-hmm. and uh, they are. So I create the blends, put them into a barrel for around three months. And uh, then that gets bottled. So it is a completely unique blend. We sell them like single barrels, but they're actually uh, like micro blends. What's um, your favorite little single barrel micro blend that you've done? I am terrible at picking favorites because I like everything. They're all your children. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I guess... I've made a lot of them. You've made a lot of them. (laughs) I'm going to let you think it for just one more second and we'll be right back. If you're planning a distillery or brewery launch, adding a distillery to your brewery, or considering purchasing an existing brewing or distilling business, then visit breweryworkshop.com for more information about the brewery and distillery workshop brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling and Craft Beer and Brewing. Over four days, you'll learn what it takes to get a successful craft beverage business off the ground through panel discussions, working group sessions, technical tours, and more. Get your ticket now at breweryworkshop.com. Okay, so do you have a favorite uh, single barrel uh, little little micro blend that you've done? So right now, I'll say in this past year, I have a, a favorite, um, and it's from our private release ride program. So um, it's a blend in the within the program it's a blend of indiana rye and canadian rye um and we blend them together put them in finishing casks so um there's a special combination of uh the right amount of indiana it's a canadian rye in an oloroso barrel Mm -hmm. uh that is just like magical Mm -hmm. um so it's like grassy and herbal, but also like very fruity. And there's like this undertone of like, like dried fruit and raisins and like a little bit of like chocolate notes. Um, so that's probably my, my favorite recent barrel. If it's anything like seagrass, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, well, thank you. Well, let's talk a little bit about just to make sure that our listeners understand the difference between sourcing versus producing in house. I I think that uh, as an industry, we are doing a disservice, not talking about sourcing more and how much fun that can be and how different of a skill set that can be as well. Yeah. So uh, barrel uh, has always been a very proud sourcing and blending whiskey. Um, And we started Joe founded the company in 2011, and uh, at that time, that wasn't something that a lot of people were talking about. Um, there were sourcing whiskey was going around and going on, but it wasn't like part of the story of the brand. Uh, it was, you know, something else, some other story. And um, you know, Joe wanted to be a proud blender and proudly sourcing. And uh, that was one of the things that drew me to the brand as well, because um, I, I I like that uh, honesty and also like owning what you're doing. So, um, so yeah, we are not distilling our own product. We are sourcing barrels from different distilleries uh, around the country and the world, um, and then we keep those barrels for some period of time and and, and watch them, and then create blends. Um, with those barrels. So a lot of our products are, like all of our bourbon products are mostly uh, at least three state blends. Um, Within those states, it could be for multiple distilleries. Um, We have 
NDAs with most of them, so we're not um, disclosing all the salaries, but we we try to always give as much information as possible. So um, the state of distillation, and then we've started doing um, a derived mash bill, uh, which is um, derived from the different mash bills in the blend by percentage. Ooh, let's dive into that. That seems very exciting. Yeah, it's... uh, I think we started it in the last year and um, it allows us to kind of, you know, give some education to somebody looking at the bottle and um, also um, look at the different um, percentages in our blends. Like maybe some people are into high rye blends and uh, you could like look at the package and say, okay, these rye percentages are kind of where I like them. Um, but it's, it's definitely a fun, fun thing. So Barrel Foundation is one of our new products that we released last year. It's a five-year hundred proof product and the drive mash bill is 73% corn, 23% rye and 4% malted barley. And then we also give the blend components on the back label and if there's bourbon from Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, and Maryland, and we give the age breakdown. So eight years from Kentucky, five, six, and nine from Indiana, eight from Tennessee, and five and six from Maryland. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to give as much information as possible uh, with what we can. Uh, so it allows some of the bourbon nerds to take that information and try to put the blend together uh, <laughs> mathematically, which is It's like decoding Taylor to, Swift. To see. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, and I imagine too, like that, and I mean, what the math is done, right? So it's not maybe complicated to you anymore, but that could get very complicated mathematically. Yeah. It's, I like building stuff in Excel and having this little uh, calculator program. So mm-hmm. for me at this point now, I just plug in the percentages and the mash bills and it like, it's very easy to get to the, the final number, but if you're trying to reconstruct it, it's a little bit harder. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> um, I think we kind of covered sourcing whiskey. What's challenging? What's fun? What's your favorite part? Is there anything more like, like for challenging? I guess we didn't really talk about that too much. Yeah, challenging, I think, is just, you know, the the market is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, prices go up and down. Sometimes they go really high. <laughs> And uh, availability can change as well. So, um, so that's probably the hardest thing. But um, that's why it definitely um, means like good forecasting and keeping an eye on the market is really important. So um, sometimes you might not need anything, but you're still always looking at uh, what's available, uh, what prices are, because you might have to plan a little differently if the market does change. So. Um, We've um, been lucky enough to be pretty flexible with with a lot of that stuff and and buy young and and hold inventory for a long time. So we kind of know uh, what we have currently and then we're we're buying for the future. Um, so it is challenging, but you have to, you just have to stay on top of it and and be prepared. Mm-hmm. And I imagine the other like you're talking a lot about finished barrel or you know barrels um, that are full, mm-hmm. and then you're also sourcing empty barrels for finishing, which has its own set of challenges as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, that does as well. So it's similar, always seeing what's available and sometimes, you know, reaching out to some, if you like a idea in your head, uh, you're reaching out to the right people to see if those barrels exist and, and if you can get them. Has there been a barrel that you've been trying to get your hands on that has seemed impossible? Or do you have like a victory story with with a barrel? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of ideas I have rolling around in my head that we haven't really been able to to capture the barrels yet. Not they're not things that I want to say yet because I'm hoping I can still get them and, and make something cool with it. Totally. Um, and talking about but... it on this podcast means someone else might grab them <laughs> if they become available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's just so many interesting things out there and I know different types of woods and different types of oaks and, um, you know, we're flavor focused 
And everything we do is to taste. So we're not using, you know, machines to test the whiskey and, and test the flavor. You know, we are tasting. Mm -hmm. um, so sourcing, finishing casks sometimes is just like, okay, I can get one or two of these. I have these barrels. Now, what is the best thing I can put in here to do R&D and see what we want? what we could maybe do in the future if we get more of these barrels. So sometimes it's just like, let's throw this in here and we'll just pull samples every month and follow it and see what happens. And um, then hope that we can get more once we have like an idea. And sometimes, you know, you can't get more. So you do a smaller release of something or, um, you know, the private barrel program, mm -hmm. things like that. But um, yeah, there's just, you know, there's so many cool things out there. So it's like, I feel like there's a untapped market that we've tapped. We're still pulling from. Right. But let's um dive in a little bit into, into dovetail. I know it predates your time at barrel, but I would love to just kind of talk about, um, I mean, the parts of the story that you are comfortable to share. Yeah. So dovetail is, um, it's a whiskey and it has uh, three different barrel finishes. So there's a rum barrel finish, a Dun Vineyards Cabernet uh, finish, and a port wine finish. Before it was named Dovetail, it was part of a line that we had that was a whiskey line. And the whiskey line was kind of like a lot of experimental stuff um, with different barrel finishes and kind of um, things that for that time you didn't really see that much of. But it had three. It was the first time they had three barrel finishes, and when submitting the cola for dub or for whiskey, it was whiskey batch five, I think. Um, it was um, basically the TTB said we needed a name for it. It couldn't be called whiskey because of the three barrel finishes, mm. and um, so it was already bottled and late pulled in. <laughs> you know, it was just sitting around ready to go. And it took, I think, about six months to a year to like figure it all out. And uh, eventually, um, Joe came up with the name Dovetail. And uh, if you don't know, Dovetail is a joint in woodworking where um, the ends kind of fit together like a puzzle piece in like a in the corner. And um, it dovetails together. So um, the name is the flavors of the three barrel finishes come together to fit like that joint they dovetail together. Um, so that's where the name came from. And uh, it was going to be a one release, like a one and done. And then uh, we released it and it sold out like that. And people kept asking for it. So Joe and the team at that time decided to make it an ongoing product. There's a few things that are cool about Dovetail. One thing is it kind of started this series that other products have fallen into, like Seagrass and Vantage, where it's a three, there's three different barrel finishes in the product. And it's something that we will make again and again. Um, but the proof will change because it's, it's all cast strength. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And so this kind of led you down an interesting path as a company. Uh, how long after it was released did, were you were you on the blending team? Maybe two years after. Okay. Um, and another interesting thing about uh, Dovetail is Dovetail is probably, if I had to like say one product that Barrel made at that time, that made me want to work for, for Barrel. Uh, because I saw the label, I was like three barrel finishes. It's a blend of bourbon and whiskey. Like, there's no way this is going to not taste like everything's fighting with each other mm. or like covering something up. So I tried it. I remember it was like right before a night, a uh, busy Friday night uh, service, and I was like behind the downstairs bar. I was like, I tried it. I was like, man, I was like. This is like really, really good. Oh and, yeah, like a taste all all the three barrel finishes. And I was just like blown away by it. I, it was like after that day that I was like, I want to work for barrel. <laughs> I remember going 
meeting you for the first time in Tennessee and having the opportunity to taste your whole lineup. And like, you, the, it, this is a good starting point for everyone to, you know, go through and you're just immediately, you know, blown away by the exact same thoughts. Like, is this going to work together? Is it going to be cohesive or is it going to meld together? And you're like, Oh man, no, this, this really works. And it just kind of pulls people into, you know, you, this is, not the craziest blend that you've done, but it gets, it gets crazier. And you're like, is this going to work? Is this going to work? And they do. And it's very impressive. Yeah. And it, um, I was impressed by dovetail. And then, um, yeah, a couple of years later I was, you know, blending dovetail. So, um, so pretty, pretty cool. I think it, it's fun when you get to, I mean, it's meet your idols, but sometimes in liquid form. Right. Um, yeah. So you got you, now you get to work work with Dovetail, one of your not maybe not your first with your first bourbon love, but a large a large love, a very yes. impactful love, and then since then you've been a part of a lot of big releases. Um, do you want to talk about Vantage and its inspiration? Yeah, so Vantage is a product. It's a bourbon with three different barrel finishes. Um, it's all. Um, new oak finishes so there's a um, mizanara barrel finish uh, french oak and american toasted oak and um, one of the things that i love about vantage is it i guess it came out of tasting whiskey it wasn't like we need to do this put this put these this liquid in these finishing cask and let's create this product it was uh our R&D program over time led us to Vantage. So before I started in 2019, they had already laid down different um, bourbon from different distilleries in different mash bills in toasted American oak barrels. So by the time I got there, I was, you know, pulling samples from these barrels and we were kind of taking notes and and just kind of watching uh, for different um changes and flavor peaks and and things like that and then um and then we did the same thing with french oak and then we did the same thing with mizanara so they were never meant to all go together it was just really like what could we make with these uh with this bourbon in these barrels and as we were pulling the samples and kind of like had tasting them in the lab um separately joe asked you know is it possible for us to do a bourbon product with these three barrel finishes? And again, like dovetail, make sure that the base blend still tastes good on its own and that you can taste the different flavor components from the finishing casks. And then also, can we continue to make it? Uh, so, um, so we kind of, went down that path to see yes is it possible and can we do it and um i think we we figured it out um and uh we released it and then we released it in september of 22 Hmm. and then uh it was number three on um uh whiskey uh whiskeys of the year that year so um so we were pretty excited about that um and um it's it's still out there it's essentially you know it's like a double barrel but uh instead of having the same barrel for the the extra barrel it's you know three different types of barrels and then we blend those together how 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 did it feel for that to get like so such good press so early on in its release it was it was exciting um i mean of course it was exciting um it's, I mean, that was a, that's a big, that's a big list of, uh, you know, everyone looks, looks for it every year and, um, uh, to get number three on there, we were the, the highest ranked bourbon as well. Mm. Um, so it felt really good and also, um, you know, allowed us to know that, like this, we're going in the right direction with this, uh, this concept. And then was, was Seagrass the next that you guys released? So Seagrass was actually before Vantage. It was. Oh, man. Well, let's talk about seagrass. It, 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 I think, um, I mean, I think this is my personal favorite from Barrelcraft. So 
I, I, we've talked about it before and i um, always happy to, to talk more about it. It's just, it, it's a really, I mean, you'll, you'll, listeners, you'll hear. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad you, you enjoy it. Um, it's definitely one of my favorites as well. Um, so seagrass, I love the like inception of seagrass too. Um, so Joe had this name in his head, seagrass. He wanted it to be a rye whiskey and he wanted to have three different barrel finishes. And he's from uh, like the Northeast. So he wanted it to remind or feel like you're standing on the coast of the Northeast, Cape Cod, and uh, the wind is coming off the sea. It's blowing through your hair and your face and your arm hair and you know, got the salinity in the air and there's like, you know, grass blowing at your feet. And like, that's what he said he wanted us to do to create seagrass, which is like crazy when you think A daunting about it. task. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, like how, how do we do that? You know, um, but I think it really allowed us to kind of open all doors and uh, test all options and kind of push our boundaries to create something that we probably wouldn't have created if he said something different, you know, um, if he didn't give us that like image uh, to, to go off of. So, um, so it took, I mean, it definitely took a long time to develop and to, to figure out, um, you know, what type of barrels we could source and, you know, which barrels we wanted to use for this product. So um, it was probably six months at least of just like testing things in the lab and trying, you know, um, the percentage of the rye blend, um, which is mostly Indiana and Canadian, uh, like getting that right. Like how do you, what's going to be the best combination here? And then once you figure out which uh, finishing casks you're going to use, like what percentage of Canadian is going to be in these barrels versus these barrels and uh, same thing with rye. So it took, took a long time to, to really figure out um, one of the, the key moments, I guess, in figuring out was like kind of right after lockdowns were kind of done, I guess, but everything, everyone was still like a little bit weird about COVID mm-hmm. um, and uh Will Shragas, who was on our team at the time, he flew in from New York and he like isolated in the hotel until he was like um, definitely not sick. And <laughs> he came to the distillery and we did like this like all night long uh, blending session in the lab. And um, we just like had a whiteboard and we're just like, what could we do? What, you know, uh, pulling tasting samples that we had um and uh we kind of came up with the the concept that night when he was in town um and it was just i think we'd all been like isolated for so long and thinking about this product for so long that when we were all together in the same room it was just like this like explosion of creativity Mm -hmm. and kind of um flavor yeah that this is this is your uh covid baby (laughs) (laughs) yeah but um yes it sounds like i mean every kind of blend you guys do has these really complicated puzzle pieces it's you know it it, there's a lot of different things that are kind of going on do you want to speak about that a little bit more i do think of it as like blending as like a flavor puzzle um that's something i i say a lot because it's not for me personally when i'm thinking about a blend like the pieces are going to work in some form, but I have to figure out what the best way is for them to merge together to allow the most flavor and not try to just force them in a direction. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is challenging and it, it's sometimes things come together really quickly and you're like, oh, wow, like, boom, that one is done. It's great. Uh, but, um, but a lot of times it just, it, it does take time and, um, and just 
consistency of not letting go of the progress that of the blend that you're working on Mm -hmm. and taking good notes (laughs) lots and lots of good notes i i remember being very jealous of you speaking about um I i don't know if you call it your blending table um but you have like basically um it's not a whiteboard, but it's some kind of drawing table where you can have all your samples out and you can leave notes on it. And I mean, it, it's the little things, right? For production, you're like, this <laughs> This seems so simple, but it's so effective and- Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, so in our lab, we have two tables and they're both, uh, they're glass tables, but you can uh, write on them with dry erase markers. So um, when I first, was on started the blending team uh joe and trip used to lay down um like big sheets of white paper and uh and kind of write on those um what samples you're tasting write your notes uh, but then our sample or our lab kept growing because our samples kept our lab didn't grow mm-hmm. our samples kept growing in our lab so <laughs> our space went away and it, it wasn't really enough room for that paper anymore. So it was just like, you're sitting down glass and it's like, you're like, well, what was the sample? What was the sample? And, and it was getting all mixed up. So um, I think it was Joe's idea to do the glass top that we could write on. And, uh, and it's been amazing ever since. Gosh. Yeah. What a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, some days there's could be 80 samples on a table and you just, you know, write on it and you can keep track of everything and go back and forth. And sometimes we'll leave stuff out for a few days and, you know, taste in the morning, taste in the afternoon for, you know, three days mm-hmm. just to kind of uh, monitor the flavor and also allow to us, our palates to, to change and uh, make sure we're getting the right flavor. Right. Because, you know, your morning taste could be influenced by coffee afternoon influenced by lunch it's all it's nice to kind of have conglomeration of data to ensure that you know you're not being biased for any environmental reasons yeah which is is very easy uh to happen so it turns out we can't get away from our environments no (laughs) or food or food what uh yeah we gotta (laughs) eat (laughs) when you're doing 80 samples in a day you know you gotta gotta maintain some food in your (laughs) belly (laughs) yeah Usually that's 80 samples split between the three of us. So I'm that, not. That's better. <laughs> it's rare that I'm tasting 80 samples in a day. I was going to say, and these are all cast strength as well. So that that can be very fatiguing. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm very protective of my palate uh, these days. Uh, so I try to only taste when it's necessary and taste the smallest amount possible uh, to be able to get the the data that I need at that moment. And like other protective practices, do you, I mean, there's so many things that you, routes you can go with this, but have, is there anything like extreme that you've done to make sure that your palate is in check? I don't think I've done anything extreme. Uh, I just try to not eat very like flavorful things during the work day. Mm -hmm. I use the, like my toothpaste is very, um, more natural, less going on in it. So it's not like uh, too minty or too uh, alcoholy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I kind of eat the same thing every every day for breakfast on a work day. And um, I try to taste, just be strategic with my tasting time. Mm-hmm. So taste before I have something to eat, taste after I have something to eat. If I have lunch, um, wait like an hour and a half to two hours before I have to taste again. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. Gotcha. The natural side of like toothpaste and whatnot, that it's, it's fascinating because it really can help and impact your palate. But like, have you ever heard of oil pulling being really damaging for your sense of scent or your sense of um, taste? No, I haven't. I've heard of oil pulling being good for your teeth, but yes. not anything about your palate. Apparently very good for your teeth, but a little dulling to your palate. Okay. So avoid well, that. Luckily, yeah, I'll avoid that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
One other thing too, I you've you guys talk a lot about you know barrels and sets of three, and that kind of follows um, like perfume accords where you're working with three ingredients and you're trying to get those work in harmony, and then you add a layer of three ingredients or you know what what have it to like make this this construct. Is that similar in your thought process with the threes just being? like more dynamic to work together, they all work in harmony. Is it just like someone's favorite number or, you know, like it it seems to work really well for you guys, which is great, but let's, let's dive into the why there. I mean, a lot of it started because dovetail dovetail did so well early on and it, um, it was something, I think it was just an idea to try, Mm -hmm. you know, could we make three barrels, these three barrel finishes work. And then, you know, we started testing with it because, you know, we wanted to add to that line. Um, and I think the three, I think it, there really is like a, a harmony that can be found there if you really take the time to, to work with it. And, you know, sometimes we have done products with two barrel finishes and, and those can work as well. Uh, but there, there is something magical, I think, to the three barrel finish. Mm-hmm. Um, just like another element of flavor that can be used to like pull out different um subtleties of the the other barrel finishes well and i mean you obviously found great success using it with dovetail and i can see why that would inspire you guys to continue to pursue it but then to have it work so well in triplicate right um like that's kind of speaking to that power as well yeah i think yeah i think they're they're doing well i mean you know we we also had Armida at one point, uh, which was a three barrel finish. Um, it's we're not currently making it, but uh, you know there will probably be another product that will come out at some point that will have three barrel finishes as well. Speaking of more products to come out, what what's next? What's exciting? What can you work on that you can? Well, what are you working on that you can speak about? <laughs> yeah, so we're always. I've got like probably about 50 different product ideas in the back of my head that I can't say anything about yet. Cause I don't know when they'll be ready. Mm-hmm. Cause they're I'm just like monitoring them in, in barrels at the moment. But, um, but one uh, series that we started last year, that's new. It is very different than the three barrel finish is uh, our cask finish series. And it's uh, bourbon with one cask finish. Uh, so kind of simplifying what we have been doing, um, but it allows us to do one to two different releases a year and kind of showcase some of these um, these barrels that we've been working with that are more unique and, um, and gives people the opportunity sometimes to taste like maybe like a deconstructed version. So like Vantage has Mizanara um, in it. And our most recent release on the uh, cast finish series is a Mizanara finish. Mm-hmm. So you could try bourbon with just a Mizanara finish, and then you could try Vantage with it, um, with the French oak and mm-hmm. the American toasted oak, which is which is pretty cool. But it's not always going to be part of the three barrel finish too. So we we've done an uh, Amberana so far, and we did one called Tail Two Islands, Ooh. which is a really cool product that's a little bit hard to explain but um so we had a product in 2018 called tail two islands and it was a an eight-year jamaican rum that was finished in isla scotch casks and it was very small release i think it was like maybe 800 900 bottles um but the people that tried it loved it and we still get questions from people like, oh, do you have any more Tail Two Islands? Uh, which we don't, but we kept the barrels and uh, we put bourbon in them. So mm. the Tail Two Islands cask finish, the most recent finish is that eight year Jamaican rum. And then behind that is the Isla Scotch casks. So mm. even though it is one finish or one barrel, um, you have like the inception blend of the, the Isla behind it. And since it's a scotch cask, you know, it was bourbon before that. So it also kind of goes full circle. Um, but it's a, it's a really, really cool one. And um, 
uh, it's one it's one of my favorites that we've, we've done in the past year. I say that sounds amazing um, and so fun that you can you know still dive into those flavors in a barrel that's been what that's that's at least three uses, but it's still there. Yeah, and the the scotch on the finish, um, it's like you wouldn't necessarily know it was there if you didn't know, mm-hmm. but it's like. And the mid palate, it kind of like shows up for a second and then it goes away. And then like on the finish, it comes back for a second. It's like, I, I love that. So kind of like a cigar blend style? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Just a tint. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that is, that is very, very cool. And, you know, if you guys also ever, are you, are you sticking with whiskey or are you, I, it didn't sound like you're going to do another rum, but, but maybe you never know. Yeah, rum's always on the table. We we love working with rum. Uh, we've had uh, the Tales of Violet's rum was really, really good. It was small. We did a gray label rum that was really good. It was, um, I think it was 13 year rum from Jamaican and Barbados and Guiana. Uh, it was awesome. Um, and we do have we do have rum, uh, so we're watching it to see if there's something exciting uh, that we we'll want to release. Well, I'm excited to think about to think about that. <laughs> uh, one of my you're you're into rum. You know, I'm I'm yes. I I don't. Um, I, I I mean, I'm kind of like I'm sure you are too. A little bit of everything. Like I I yeah. like I I like to try it all because it is just a world of flavor, and there's so many different ways to achieve that. So it's really fun to just dive into different different flavor worlds and rum is one of those um and you know just from a cocktail standpoint too thinking about you know an eight-year jamaican rum with a hint of smoke and like a daiquiri i don't know why but that just sounds very nice right now yes (laughs) yes uh i like classic daiquiri with like the perfect rum is one of my favorite cocktails it's like so simple but it's so good very underrated like ever, like yes. if you had a good daiquiri, you know, like we've all had bad ones too, but a good daiquiri, oh yes, hits a spot. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've tried it or not, but uh, seagrass in a classic daiquiri, it is awesome. I have not, and I'm adding it to my list <laughs> right now. Seagrass is really well at tiki cocktails. Oh, I love that. Uh, who, I mean, who doesn't like tiki time? Yeah. Well, Nick, it's been so excellent talking with you today and you've given me a lot of inspiration on my cocktail list and things to add. Um, I, I really appreciate all your time and yes, just thank you for being here. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, I appreciate your time. For more than 30 years, G&D Chillers has had the proven solution for distilleries. Visit them today at gdchillers.com. Whether establishing a new distillery or expanding into a brew distillery, ABS Commercial is your full-service equipment manufacturer for equipment ranging from 50 liters to 5,000 liters. Visit breweryworkshop.com to secure your ticket to this September's brewery and distillery workshop. If you've enjoyed this podcast, go to spiritsanddistilling.com and sign up for our free newsletter featuring new stories every week from some of the best writers and distillers in the distilling world. We'll be back in two weeks with another in-depth distilling conversation for you. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. This podcast has been brought to you by Craft Spirits and Distilling for those who love to make and drink great spirits. Join our free newsletter today at spiritsanddistilling.com for pragmatic, technical, and creative distilling stories in your inbox every week. Sign up now at spiritsanddistilling.com or click on the link in the show notes.